Knowing the basics of Mongoose is great for building out projects, but understanding advanced concepts is going to take your code to the next level, which is why in this video we're going to cover not only the basics, but all the important advanced concepts in Mongoose that you need to know. And these are concepts I don't see being covered in any other tutorial. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name's Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And today I'm gonna to be talking all about Mongoose, beginner and advanced concepts. And the first thing you need to know about Mongoose is it's a wrapper around MongoDB. So if you don't already understand MongoDB, I highly recommend checking out my full MongoDB crash course. I'll link in the cards and description. And also download this MongoDB cheat sheet that I have. It's completely free, covers every MongoDB command you need to know. And that's important because all of these commands are available in Mongoose. I'm gonna link this down in the description as well. Now to get started with Mongoose, we're just gonna open up a blank project and we're gonna create a file called script.js. You can call this whatever you want, it really doesn't matter. And we're also going to initialize npm. So we're just gonna say npm init dash y. And if you don't already have npm, you need to install node to get that. I have a video covering that, I'll link in the cards and description for you. Once you've done that, just type in npm i mongoose, and that's going to install the mongoose library so we can actually use it inside of our project. And the only other thing I wanna do is I wanna install another library as a dev dependency. So we're gonna say dash dash save dev, and we're gonna type in nodemon. This is just going to automatically refresh our script file every single time we make a change, which is going to be great so we don't have to keep rerunning our script. So in our package JSON, let's change this test script to say dev start. And we're just going to change this to say nodemon script.js, which is that file that we just created. So now all we need to do in our console is run npm run dev start. And it's just going to run the code in our script.js. And every single time we make changes, such as if I just put hi in here and save, you can now see that's being printed out to the bottom of my screen. So now we can actually rerun our code every single time we make changes. Now, the first thing you wanna do with Mongoose is you need to connect it to a database. So we need to get that Mongoose library by requiring that at the top of our page. And then in order to connect with Mongoose, you can just say mongoose.connect. And this just takes the URL to your database. If you have MongoDB locally installed already, you can just use the MongoDB URL here, which is mongodb slash slash localhost. And then you put a slash and the name of your database. In our case, we're just gonna use a database called testdb. And when we save, we're now connected to MongoDB. You don't really notice anything because nothing gets printed out, but this connect function takes two other arguments. You can pass it in a function here, and this is going to be a function that's called every single time you connect. So we can just say console.log connected. And now when we save, you can see as soon as we connect, it prints out connected down here. And then the second function you can pass this is like an error function. So we can, you know, error out any message. So if we fail to connect for some reason, it'll print out that error down here. But the nice thing about MongoDB is even though it takes a while to connect to the database, if you start using Mongoose and interacting with your MongoDB database, it'll queue up all the commands you make and only make those commands after you connect. So you don't have to worry about waiting for a connection because it'll do that internally for you, which is why generally I just ignore all these options and just do a simple mongoose.connect. Now inside of Mongoose, there are three main concepts you need to understand. The first concept is the idea of a schema and a schema just defines what the structure of your data looks like. So if you have a user object, you're gonna have a user schema that says, oh, the user has a name, an email, an age, a birthday, and so on. A model is just that schema in an actual form that you can use. So a model is like an individual user object from the database that you can interact with. And then we have a query, and a query is essentially just a query you're making against the MongoDB database. Those are the only three things you really need to understand about Mongoose in order to use it. And the most important of those is going to be the schema. So to create a schema, you could do it all in one file, but generally you're going to have a different file for each schema. So let's create a user.js file where our user scheme is going to live. And we need to make sure we get mongoose pulled in. So we're gonna require that mongoose library so we can use it. And then in order to create a schema in mongoose, you can type in new mongoose.schema. And inside of here, you're going to pass it an object with all the different options you need for your schema. And we're just gonna save this to a variable called user schema, just like that. So we can use the schema in a little bit. Now a schema takes in an object and this object is just going to be key value pairs where the key is the name of the key in your MongoDB object, your database. So if we want the user to have a name, we're just gonna give it a key of a name. And then the value of this key value pair is going to be the type this thing is. So a name is going to be a string. And you can use a bunch of different types. We're gonna cover them all in this video, but for now, we just have a user schema that defines a name field and that name is going to be a string. If we wanted to add something else such as age in here, we could just add that and then we say it's going to be a number type. And this is where you put all the information for your schema, all the different fields that it's going to take and so on. Once you've defined that, then what you need to do is to create the model for that schema. So what we can do is we can say that we want to do mongoose 
whoops, mongoose.model, and this is a function. This function takes in the name of our model, which in our case is user. This is the name that you're going to see inside the MongoDB database. So this would be like a user collection inside of MongoDB. And then we pass it our schema. So we're gonna pass it our user schema. So now we've created a brand new model which has the name user and it's going to be for our user schema. Now, generally when you do that, you're gonna to wanna to export that. So we're gonna say module.exports equals that model right here. And then we can use that other places. So now we have a basic schema with a name and an age for our user in our script.js. We can import that user model and we can say, hey, we want to require that dot slash user model that we just created, that file we just created, and now we have access to this user. And if I just come down here, you can say I type in user dot, and you're gonna see there's going to be a bunch of different functions and methods that I can use on this user. And the important thing to note is that a lot of the things you can do in MongoDB, you can do on this user collection. So for example, in MongoDB, you have a bunch of functions like find, find, one, you know, insert many, insert, update, delete, all of those normal MongoDB methods that you have are all available on this user object. The one that we wanna talk about first though is going to be how do you create a new user? Well, the easiest way to do that is just instantiate this as a new user object and you just pass it an object. For example, our object is going to be the keys that we want our thing to have. So we want it to have a name of Kyle and let's give it an age here of 26. So now we've created a brand new object with the name of Kyle in the age of 26. But when I save, you'll notice nothing actually happens because all we're doing is creating this user. We can put them inside of a variable called user, but we haven't saved this user to the database. We just have a local copy inside of our JavaScript program, but it's not in our database yet. To do that, we need to call the user.save function. And this is an asynchronous function. So you can, you know, use dot then on the end of it. And we could say, you know, right here, console.log user saved. There we go. And if we save, you're gonna see it prints out user saved because it saved that user to the database. Now, generally, instead of using this promise syntax of dot then, you're gonna be using this in an async function. So let's just create a simple function called run. This is going to be an async function. And then we can just use the await keyword instead of dot then. It's a little bit cleaner to work with, in my opinion. And make sure this is all inside that run function. And we're gonna call that run function. And if you're unfamiliar with async await, I have a full video on it. I'll link in the cards and description. But now we can just do a console log of the user and if we just wait a second, you can see down here, we have a user with the name of Kyle, an age of 26, an ID, which has this random ID right here, and then this dash dash V. So in MongoDB, you'll know that everything has an auto-generated ID. That's what this underscore ID field represents. It represents our ID. And then Mongoose keeps track of versioning. It's mostly for internal use, so don't really worry about it, but that's what this underscore underscore V stands for. You don't need to worry about it. It's just there for Mongoose. Now this is the most basic way to create a user, but there's also another way you can create a user by using the create method on the actual user class here. And we can just pass all the parameters we want to that create method, just like this. Make sure we await that, and that's going to return to us a new user. This await method right here, this dot create, does the exact same thing as saying new user and save. Both of these are gonna do the same thing. So when we save, you can see we get again a brand new user with the name of Kyle and the age 26. Another important thing to note is if you wanna update a user, let's say I wanna change the user's name. Well, I could just say user.name is equal to Sally. So now I've changed my local user object's name, but I haven't changed the actual version in the database yet. To do that, I could just call that save method again. So now if I wait this and save, you can see the name here is Sally, and this is actually saved in the database. It first creates a user with the name Kyle, and then it takes the name of that user, changes it to Sally, and by calling save, we're actually saving that to the database. Now this is obviously the most basic way you can use Mongoose. So now I wanna jump back to our user schema and define a bunch of different other schema types. Right now we've just talked about strings and numbers. So let's add in a bunch of different fields here. For example, an email is going to be the type of string, pretty straightforward. Created at is going to be a date, so we can specify that we want this to be a date. We can do the same thing, for example, for an updated at field. So I'll put an updated at here. And I'm also going to come down below that and we're gonna have like a nested object. So we're gonna have a best friend field. And this best friend is going to represent another user. So in this case, we want this to be an object ID. You can see this object ID right here. So to get that, we can just say mongoose.schema types dot object ID. And this is going to say, hey, this best friend is a reference to another object based on the ID. So this is an ID of another user object. Then we can come down here, we can say hobbies, and this is going to be an array. And to define an array, we just take the array syntax and put the actual type we want inside of it. So this is an array of strings. If we left this blank, it could be an array of anything at all that we want. In our case though, this is an array of different strings. And then finally, you can also nest things just like you can in MongoDB. So we have an address. This address is going to have a street property, which is a string, and it's going to have a city, which is also a string. 
So now we've defined this user schema much more in depth. We have all these additional properties. And if we go back to our script here, we can add a bunch of different properties into there. So let me just simplify this code a little bit, put these on a new line so we can really see what's going on here. And we can say, you know what, let's add in a hobby. So we'll say our hobbies is going to be equal to an array and our array is going to have here weight, lifting, and let's put in here bowling. Now when we save, you can see we have this hobbies array that has weightlifting and bowling inside of it. Or we could take our address and we could say, hey, you know what, our address has a street and this street is going to be main street. And now if I save, you can see that this has that main street nested inside the address key. Now, an important thing to note about nested objects like this is there's actually two ways to do it inside of Mongoose. You can do it like this where you just put the object inside or you can do it where you define a whole separate schema. So let's say that we wanna have an address schema and that's going to be equal to a new mongoose.schema. And this schema is just going to be all the stuff from address. So I'm just going to copy this up into the schema here. And then we're going to say our address schema is for our address. Let me just make sure I have all my indentation correct. There we go. So this mongoose schema for address just has a street and a city. And then down here, we're saying our address is our address schema. And you'll notice down here, we just ran our code again by saving. And you'll see that our address has that street, but it also has this ID property, which is kind of interesting. There aren't really too many differences between doing it this way with a schema or just nesting it directly inside. But if you have a more complex object, for example, this address is pretty simple. We could just nest it inside. But if you had a complex object with a lot of other things inside of it, sometimes doing nested schemas like this is the better route. Now, the nice thing about defining everything like this, for example, strings and numbers and so on, is if in my script, for some reason, I changed this age to be a string and I clicked save, you're going to notice we get an error running and we can easily catch that error by just wrapping this all inside of a try catch. So we can say catch an error and then we can put all the code for creating our user up inside this try. And then the catch, we can come down here, we can actually print out our error. So we could say console.log e.message. And now if I save, you can see user validation failed, age cast to number failed for value, whatever we passed in there, type string at path age. So it gives us an error message for the errors that we commit against this mongoose model. So if our user is not valid when we try to save it or create it or update it, it's going to give us errors for that. And there are certain plugins you can install for mongoose to make these errors a little bit better so you can print them out to users because right now these are kind of long and complicated error messages, but you get a bunch of other information. For example, if I say e.errors.age, that's going to give me a bunch of information about this error. You can see we have certain codes and we have actual values, expected values, all these different things, you know, the kind, the value, the path. So we have super in-depth information about this error, but generally 99% of the time, all you care about is that error message. So now let's fix this. We're gonna put our age back to how we had it before. And I wanna talk about some more in-depth validations because right now just having type validation is good, but it's not as good as it could be. What happens if we wanna make sure a field is required? Let's say we want the email to be required. Well, right here, all we're doing is defining a type for it. And if all you need to do is define a type, like our name string here, that's fine. But once you need to start adding additional things, such as the required flag, what you wanna do is you wanna pass an object instead of just a type. And this object is going to take some parameters. The first is the type. So we wanna make sure we pass the type as one of the keys. So we're saying this email is a string. And right now, this, what we have right here is the exact same as what we did for our name string. It's just a longer version and it's gonna work exactly the same. But now we can add additional properties to our email, for example, we could say that required is going to be set to true. And now when we save, you can see we're getting an error because it says email is required, but we didn't pass an email. So now if we come in here, let's just put an email in here, which is going to be test at test.com. And you can now see that if we just put the comma right here and save, it's going to have that email there and we no longer get the error. So we're using that required validation. Now, one thing about emails that you'll know is that they almost always should be lowercase because it doesn't matter if they're uppercase or lowercase, emails are case insensitive. So you can actually say that, hey, this email should automatically be lowercase by passing the flag lowercase with true. Now, when I save, you can see the email it saves as lowercase. Even though the email I typed in here had uppercase letters inside of it, it automatically made those lowercase. And you can even do the reverse by doing uppercase instead. And that would give us a full uppercase email, but obviously in our case, lowercase is what we're looking for. Now there's a few other types that I wanna talk about. For example, on our created at, we want this to be by default a date and we want it to default to the current date and time. So we could pass this default property. And for example, we could pass in, you know, whatever we want here and we could say new date like this. And it's just going to give us a brand new date as the default. And when we save, you can see this created at right here as a new date. But the problem with this is it queries the new date once because it runs this code. So it's giving us like a static value. It'd be the same as if we typed in like five here as the default. Instead, we wanna run a function. Every time that we create an object, we wanna generate a new date. So we could say like date.now. And now what's happening is every single time we save or create a user, 
this default is being run to make sure, hey, do we have a value for created at? If not, run this function and whatever it returns, use that. So now we're automatically getting the newest date every single time. I wanna copy this down for updated at because I wanna do the same thing. By default, my updated date should be the current date. So now when I save, you can see created at and updated right here are just defaulted to the current date. While we're on the topic of this, another important thing you can do is use the immutable flag. So we can say immutable, set that to true, and now that means we cannot change this created at at all. It'll never let us change created at. Even if we're inside of our script here and we try to say, hey, you know what? User.created at, let's say we wanna change it to like five for some reason. It doesn't really matter. We're changing it to something and now we wanna say await user.save. And if we save, you're gonna notice nothing happens, we don't get any errors, and this created out here has not changed. And that's because when it's immutable, it just ignores all the times that you try to set it to anything. It'll just never let you set the created at value. Now the last two main built-in types I wanna talk about are for minimum and maximums. For example, we can specify a min and max number for our age. So we can say that the type here is number, and let's say we want the min to be one. The, you know, the youngest you can be is one. So if inside of here we put our age was a negative 26, we're gonna get an error that says, hey, it must be at least one, that's the minimum value. We could also put in a max and say like 100 is the max. And if I try to tell myself that I'm 260, we're gonna get an error saying it's over the max of 100. And you can do the exact same thing with strings. So for example, we could say our min length here, whoops, length is going to be one, or let's make it 10 for some reason. So that says our email must be at least 10 characters long. So if I make our email shorter, you're gonna notice we're gonna get an error. If I just get rid of this error here, that says our email is shorter and it must be at least 10, and you can do the same thing for maximum. Now the last type of validation that I wanna talk about is going to be validation that's built around custom validation that you write yourself. So let's say on our age, we wanna add some custom validation. Well, you can use a validate object here, and this validate object, you're going to pass it a validator. So we're gonna say a validator, and this is a function that runs to check if this value is valid. So it's gonna take in a value, and we just return true or false. So let's say that we wanna make sure this number is always even. We could just do mod two here. That's going to check, is this number even? If so, true, otherwise false. And then we can also specify a message. And this message takes in this props object and this props contains the value. So we could say, for example, props.value, which is going to give us whatever our age is, is not an even number, just like that. So now when I save this and we come over, you're gonna notice that we actually get an error and that's because this should say, equals zero, that's going to actually check if this is an even number or not. And now you can see it's working, but if we change our age to 27, we're gonna get an error that says, hey, 27 is not an even number. So this is really nice because you can do all this validation on the model itself, which means you don't have to worry about writing this validation code all over the rest of your place. It's all in one spot and it's gonna give you nice errors that you can use everywhere else. Now there is one issue with all this validation though, built in or custom, it doesn't matter. It's only gonna run when you use the create or the save method. And so far we've done everything with the create or save method. So you're probably thinking that's not a huge deal, but there's a bunch of other methods built into Mongoose that you can use to update things in your database without using the create or save methods. And those don't go through validation because they work directly on the MongoDB database. So let me talk about some of those different methods. As you can see, when we say user dot, we're going to have a lot of different methods that we can choose from here. And a lot of these are for querying information. For example, we have find or count and so on. We have create right here that we talked about. But you'll also note if we go a little bit further, we have these sections such as find by ID and remove or and update or and delete. And same thing with here, and update and replace for find one. And these things where you do like find one and update, or if we scroll down a little further, where we have functions such as update one or update many, those do not go through validation, which is why I always recommend you do not use these methods. I'd recommend always doing just a normal find by ID or find one, get your user and then call save on that user. Don't do the find one and update or find by ID and update because that's going to skip all of your validation. Now I do wanna talk a little bit about how you use some of these query methods though, like find by ID and find one. So let's just comment out or get rid of this code that we have here for now. And I wanna just copy this ID that we have. So this is an ID of the object that we just created most recently. So I could say user.findById, pass it in the ID right here, cons user equals awaiting that, and this is going to get us a brand new user. And again, this is all asynchronous code, returns promises, console.log user, and hopefully this should get us this exact user we just created. So when I save, you can see it returns to us the user that contains that exact ID that we just queried for, super useful. Now, if you wanna do a little bit more of a generic query, you can do the find method. And the nice thing about this find method is it works identically to how it does in MongoDB. So I could say, hey, I wanna find where the name is Kyle. And now when I click save, that's going to give me a bunch of users. So if we look in our you know, console, you can see we have a bunch of users because everything we so far have created has been with the name of Kyle. 
Now, if we were to search for a name, you know, that doesn't exist, such as S, and we click save and we scroll down, you notice we're just going to get an empty array. So this query method, like I said, it works pretty much identical to MongoDB. So if you understand how MongoDB queries work, it's going to work super well. You can also change this out for find one. And if we put in here, for example, Kyle, you can see it's just going to find us the very first one that has that match. So we're going to just the first user with the name Kyle. We also have methods such as exists. And this is going to say, hey, does something exist that matches this? So for example, yes, we do have at least one user with the name of Kyle in our database. And then we have those other things, you know, we have like find one and delete and remove and replace and update. I recommend again, don't use these. And you also have things like update one. Again, I wouldn't use that. But one that is really useful is delete one. And this is going to just delete whatever matches. The first thing that matches is going to be what's deleted. Or you could do like a delete many, and that's going to delete everything that matches the query. So we could say like delete one right here. That doesn't actually return to us anything useful. But here we could say delete one where the name is Kyle, and we're going to save. And that's deleting one of the users with the name of Kyle. And we can just see what this returns to us. And as you can see, it says deleted count equals one because it deleted one person. Now, one thing about MongoDB that is a little confusing is the syntax for the find method is kind of confusing in MongoDB, which means it's confusing in Mongoose, which is why Mongoose implemented something called queries. A query is where you can say dot where, and this dot where allows you to essentially create your own query, your own find syntax based on a bunch of really nice helper methods. So let's say, hey, we want to check where the name is equal to Kyle. Well, we could say where name equals Kyle. And this is going to do the exact same thing we did before. As you can see, it returned to us all the users with the name of Kyle. Or we could say, hey, I want to check where the age is going to be greater than 12. And now we can do that. And again, we get all the users with the age greater than 12. You can also just continue to change these together. So we could say, oh, you know what? Also, I want to check where the name is equal to Kyle. So now it's going to say, hey, where the age is greater than 12 and where the name is equal to Kyle. And again, of course, we're getting all of our users being returned and we can keep chaining this together. For example, also, I want to get the users where the age is less than, for example, 31. And let's just make this an actual number, not a string. And again, we're going to get everything because everything's less than 31. But if I change it to 21, you're now going to see we get nothing because there are no users where the age is between 12 and 21 and the name is Kyle. If we get rid of this less than real quick, we'll get all the users being returned, but we can also put in a limit. Let's say we only want two users. Now limit two, we're getting two results being returned to us. We can also do a select, which says only get certain fields. So let's say I only want to get the age field. So now I'm going to get the age field for those two objects, and that's the only thing being returned. Now the final thing with queries I want to talk about actually requires us to modify our schema. So if we go back into our schema, let's scroll down to where we have this best friend. I want to expand this. So our type here is going to be an object ID, and what I also want to do is I want to specify a ref and we're referencing the user model. This ref tells Mongoose, hey, what model does this object ID reference? In our case, we're referencing the user model because this is just going to be a reference to another person in our database. And now what I want to do is I want to add a best friend to one of our users. So let's just come in here. We're going to say that we want to, you know, just limit this to one. So we're going to have one user. So we're going to say user zero dot best friend is going to be equal to and I want to just equal that best friend here to this ID. So we're just going to paste in that ID and then I'm going to save them. So we'll say user zero dot save here. Make sure I put this all correctly. There we go. Dot save. Make sure that we await this. And there we go. We save that real quick. Now they have this best friend right here. So now when we access that user, let's get rid of this select here and we're just going to be getting that user. Let's get rid of this code here. So we're getting that user that we just updated and when we click save, you're gonna notice they now have that best friend which has an ID. Well, what we can also do is we can use something called dot populate. And we're going to say we want to populate the best friend field. And when I save, you're gonna notice something interesting. Now that best friend, instead of just being an ID, has all of the data for the actual best friend object. And that's really cool because in MongoDB, you can't really do joins very well. So Mongoose has this populate method which essentially allows you to do a join. It's saying, hey, for all the best friend IDs inside of this model and all the other models, go and find that object and put all the data for it inside of this best friend section. So now we can actually do a join without really doing a join. It's a really cool feature of Mongoose. Now this right here is a lot of the more basic features of Mongoose. So now we want to start talking about some of the advanced things you can do related to schemas, which really can make your code take it to the next level. So let's go over to our user model here. You can see we defined everything in this schema. Let's just minimize this because we're not actually going to modify the data in the new schema. We're going to be adding stuff onto our schema afterwards. One of my favorite things that you can add is methods. So I could say, hey, user schema. And I want to add essentially a method onto each instance of our user. So when we query a user here, for example, if we just say user dot find one, and we're going to get one where the name 
is equal to Kyle. So it's just gonna give us one single user. If we scroll down here, we have that first user with that name. So what I wanna do is I wanna add a method onto every single instance of our user. So we can just say user schema dot methods, and then we put dot whatever the name of the method is. In our case, let's make this method called say hi. And we set that equal to a function. And now the important thing in Mongoose is that you cannot use an arrow function here. You must use an actual function. And that's because in this function, you use this to reference the actual individual instance you're working with. So let's say here, we're gonna console.log, we're gonna say, hi, my name is, and then we're gonna print out this dot name. And it's going to get the name for the individual user. So now all of our user models have this new method called say hi on them. So now what I can do here is I can say user dot say hi. And now when I run that, you can see it says, hi, my name is Kyle. And we added that in our schema. Now you're probably thinking, wow, that say hi method is useless and you're right. But these methods are really good for when you want to just do a bunch of different things related to your model. And you don't want to have to define that code everywhere. You can just define it on your model itself. Now you can also define static methods that are going to be available on the actual model. So not the instances, but the overall model itself. So when you do like user.find, you can create your own methods that do similar things. So to do that, you can say user schema dot statics. This is going to be for defining these static methods. And we're going to call this find by name. And again, set that to a normal function. And inside of here, we're going to pass a name to this function. Now, inside of this function, what we want to do is we just want to return essentially a new query. So we're going to say this dot where the name here is going to be a regular expression. So we're going to use regular expressions. And we're checking for the name. And we're just going to make sure this is case insensitive. So what this simple set of code right here does is we're doing a simple where query, and then we're taking our name we pass in, passing it to a regular expression just so it's case insensitive, and we're saying get me all the users that have that name. So find the user by that name. And now when we click save, we can actually use this method. So inside of here, instead of saying find one where the name is Kyle, we can say find by name. And what we can do is we can pass in that name of Kyle, and we should hopefully get the exact same result being printed to our screen. And you can see that we have this Kyle object being printed out right here. And it's actually getting us a bunch of different users, which is why users say hi isn't working. But as you can see here, we're getting a bunch of different objects being printed out because it's getting us every user with that name Kyle. You'll also notice over here, I used a slightly different syntax for where, and that's because where can also take essentially the same thing as a find. You can do it however you want. Now on top of this, we can also add things to our queries themselves. So right now we added things to our like user dot, but what happens if you wanna add something particularly only to a query? We can say user schema dot query, and here we can do like by name. And that's gonna be equal to a function, and we're gonna pass it in the name, and this is gonna be almost exactly the same code. So I'm just gonna copy this down here, paste it right here. And actually up here where we have find by name, I'm gonna change this to find instead of where. So it's gonna be exactly the same, but this is just going to say find, and this is going to say where. And the reason for that is because this is gonna be chainable with a query, and this I just want to return. I don't want it to actually do any query related stuff. So now when I save, we now have this by name method that we can use as well. So in our script, we can say user.find, and we wanna find by name, which is going to be Kyle. So now when we save, you're gonna see we get all the users with that name. But you'll notice we can't call by name directly on the user. It's actually going to give us an error. It says by name is not a function. And that's because when you use user schema.query, we're only putting this method on the query. And the query is returned when you call something like dot find, or when you say dot where. That's going to return to you a new query that you can use, which is where this like by name is going to come in. And for example, if we wanted to say like find by name, this is only available on the actual user itself. So you cannot do it as part of a query. So it's kind of interesting they made this distinction. You have to kind of figure out, do you want this to be a static level method or a query level method? Now, the last thing I want to talk about is probably my favorite thing. And this is something called a virtual. So we can say user schema dot virtual. And how you define these is a little bit different. You're going to pass this a value and that's going to be the value of the name of your virtual. So we're going to call this named email. And this is working very similar to like user schema dot query dot by name. This named email is the same thing as like by name or find by name. It's the name we're giving this virtual. And a virtual is essentially a property that is not actually on the actual schema itself, but it's a virtual property that's based on other properties already on there. So we can give this a dot get and a dot set. So let's just give it a dot get here. And the dot get again takes a function. And remember, you cannot use arrow functions. And in this function, we just return a value. So we're gonna say, hey, you know what? We wanna return here this dot name. And then we wanna put the email inside of these brackets. So this dot email, just like that. So now we've created a named email property. So this is just a property that exists on an individual user. So let's say that we wanna find one and we wanna get them where the name here is Kyle. Let's just go back so we have one user and I wanna say user.named email and I'm gonna console.log that out. 
Now, when I save, you can see down here, it's saying Kyle and undefined. That's just because we have no email on this user. If the user did have an email though, the email would go right here. So let's say also where the email is test at test.com. Now you can see we got it says Kyle and then it puts the email into this section. But you'll notice on our actual object, there is no named email property. This is a virtual property, so it doesn't get saved in the database. It's only available inside of our code. And this is great because you don't wanna save this named email property in your database because it duplicates all this data but you probably wanna use this all across your application. So this virtual is the perfect way to do that. Now I know we've covered a lot so far, but I have one final topic I wanna to talk about, which is middleware inside of Mongoose. If you used Express, you're probably familiar with middleware, but middleware in Mongoose allows you to insert code in between different actions. For example, saving a user or creating a user. And there's going to be middleware that covers saving, validating, removing, and update one. Don't really worry about the update one. Really the only middleware you care about is going to be save, validate, and remove. So in order to create some middleware, you wanna take your user schema and you wanna say either pre or post. So if you want this middleware to occur before the thing that we're talking about, you use pre. So if I wanna do some middleware before I save my model, I'm going to use pre. And then I say save. So this is either gonna be save or something like validate here, or it's gonna be remove. So if you wanna like do something before you delete something, use remove. Or if you wanna do it before you validate, use validate. In our case, we wanna do something before we save. And we want to run a function and this function takes in the next property and just like normal middleware you call this next function to move on to the next middleware if you want to do that so here all i want to do is i want to take my updated at and all i want to do is set it to date dot now i just want to update my updated at to the newest time and then call next so what this does is it says every time i go to save a user i want to take this updated field update it and then continue on with the rest of my code, go on to the save, for example. If I left this nest out, it's not actually going to move on to the next thing in line. So now by doing this, if we were to update this user, you're going to see that it's going to update that updated at field for us. So right now, the updated at field here is, you know, 20, 21, 11, 05, and we have 17, 04, 28. So now if we wanted to come in here and we say user save, and we make sure that we await this, we should see that this updated time is in incremented. And we're just gonna make sure we console log the user down here below it. And now when we save, you can see this updated time is 0457. And before, if we scroll up here a little ways, you can see it was 0428. So it has been incremented to the newest updated at time. We can also do a post, for example, if I come into here, I can just copy all of this code. We're gonna do a post save. So we're gonna change pre to post, and this is going to happen after the save. And here, all I wanna do is I just wanna say this dot say hi. But we actually cannot use this because instead it's going to pass to us the document that's been saved. So here we can say doc.sayHi. And this doc right here is just the user object, the thing that has been saved. So now it's going to say hi and then move on to the next piece of middleware. So now if we go into our script and we just save this, if I scroll all the way down here, you can see it says, hi, my name is Kyle. And that happens directly after save. So it's happening between this user log and the one below it. Now these middleware are great because they allow you to actually make sure things go on. So if you don't wanna allow save, you can just get rid of this next right here. And now you're going to see that this save fails. And in order to actually show you how that's failing, let's just put in here an error. So we can throw a new error. And let's give it a message of fail save. Now when we click save here, you can see it's printing out fail save. And that's because here we're catching that error and printing it out here. If I get rid of this console log user, it's easier to see it just says fail save. So by throwing an error, we can say, hey, you know what, abort the save, I don't actually wanna do it. And that's great for these pre-save, pre-value, post-save and so on. And that's everything you need to know about Mongoose. Also, if you want to make sure you take your MongoDB game to the next level, you're going to want to download my free MongoDB cheat sheet linked below. It's going to help you with MongoDB and Mongoose, so I highly recommend it. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.